I'm Philip Dickens, and this is From the Hill of Megiddo, the podcast serialization of my book of the same name. In the last episode, we learned that there are demons living among humans, and the fanatics among them are trying to purge those with any human lineage. Hazel and Jess also received intel on the vampires and how they're intending to break the seventh seal and bring about Armageddon. There's a confrontation coming, so let's dive into the next three chapters. Chapter 18 Well, it's valuable information if it's accurate. Jack's words faded like a vanishing signal as the migraine hit. It pushed in on Pruth's temples from either side, and in moments made his whole head feel as if it was being crushed by a vice. He closed his eyes and tried to will it away, but in the darkness the pain didn't subside even slightly. Instead it spread, heat rising around his eyes and his sinuses clogging up. His whole jaw ached and his throat closed, flesh trembling slightly as though holding in a large burp. Constriction in his chest made it hard to breathe and his heart sped up. His stomach roiled and bubbled and lower down his bowels felt as though something unfathomably large was pushing against them, eager to get out. He cried and banged the conference room table, eyes still squeezed shut. There were several cries of shock, followed by people calling his name in concern. A Nile, right next to him, was the largest of them, but she might as well have been in a whole other country. As the pounding, rushing, squeezing pain overwhelmed him, he was beyond reach. In the next instant, it was gone. A memory, leaving behind only a euphoric numbness in its wake. No more pain though. Slowly, he opened his eyes. He was no longer in the conference room of Cyclades Tower, listening to what a vampire had told Hazel and Jess the night before. Instead, he was on a hilltop in the darkness, surrounded by very old ruins, heat and red light fading as the chasm closed just beneath his feet. He remembered it well, except that in his memory, a Nile stood opposite him. It wasn't here now. He didn't move or speak. All he did was hold Puth's gaze for several long seconds perhaps a minute, and smile. Then the pain exploded in him again, causing him to cry out. He closed his eyes and grabbed at his head, kicking out against it as he fell to the ground and curled up into himself. There was no sensation at all except for the pain, no outside world. He wasn't in the conference room or atop Talmegado. He was nowhere and suffering. The pain took longer to subside this time, and as it did, he found his whole body trembling with the aftershocks of it. His throat felt raw as though he had been shouting at the top of his lungs. His back and chest throbbed, and his body was slick with sweat. Everybody in the conference room was gathered around him, looks of shock and concern on their faces. Anil and Miles were closest, crouching by him with their hands out. Ruth, can you hear me? Do you know where we are? Anil asked. I... He rasped, found it too hard to speak. A nod and a waved hand seemed to suffice to prove that he was back with them. They helped him to a sitting position and offered a glass of water. He drank it greedily, then took several deep breaths before he attempted to speak again. Sorry about that, I never... Don't apologise. What happened? Are you okay? I am now, I think. It was... Another deep breath as he processed what he had seen. Shit. I think it was a vision. A vision of what? This was Miles. Of Nuadu? He looked around everyone. I saw Nuadu. I think he's arrived. Jazz looked the intruding vampire up and down. He was dressed in skin tight leather which showed off an extremely slinky voluptuous figure and had purple hair which was just the right kind of untidy. Like she had just been through exactly what he'd like to do to her. She caught him looking and winked which just fleshed out the idea in his mind. Christoph was also having dark thoughts about her as he paced around her, but they were a very different kind of dark. He wore a deep-set frown, his eyes glowing red, and was grinding his teeth. He stopped pacing and for several moments stared before speaking. When he did, he picked over his words extremely carefully. You have courage, Blair. But it is the courage of unthinking fools. Did you really believe that you could come here, make your threats, and still live to tell of it? Blair tilted her head. I made no threats, only told you the truth. And whether I live isn't the point. My lord simply wishes that you are aware of the truth, as I have conveyed it to you. Your lord? And who might that be? 
He never said I could tell you that. Hmm. Very well. Christoph nodded solemnly and resumed pacing, though slower and with less anger in his eyes now. You wish to serve your master well, do the job that was asked of you. I can appreciate that. It's a just a shame that whoever they are, they have placed you in such an untenable position. It took Gaz several seconds longer to register that Christoph had moved. It took Blair longer than that. She stared at him, blinking slowly. Then she tried to speak, and blood spooled out of her mouth. She gagged, trying to hold it back, then slowly tilted her head to look down. The thick metal shaft had gone right through her heart, the sharp end poking out of her back. It wouldn't kill her, as only decapitation could do that, but remaining alive was no mercy here. Her legs gave way and she dropped to her knees. Kristoff stepped close and leaned over her, grinning. Perhaps the one you serve can remove that from your chest so that you may begin to heal. If he does, tell him that no matter who he is, he can never scare me. Not in the way that my master, no Adwai and Dawn, ought to terrify him. Blair gave no answer except to convulse and vomit blood. Bri was staring. Gaz slapped his shoulder and then nodded. As if to say that was why he had tried to stop Bri from getting on the wrong side of Fristoff. He probably understood now. Well, you had best get crawling. There was fire in Lydia's eyes. Of course there was. It was part of the reason he... Part of what made her so attractive. He didn't want to name his feelings towards her just yet. It was too soon, wasn't it? If he thought it, then he might accidentally say it aloud, and she would think he was being too pushy. The last thing he wanted was to scare her off. Not when things were going so well. He shook his head. Back to the point. Lid, I know. I just want to make sure... I can fight. I want to fight. This is important. He said. He gritted his teeth. This wouldn't be easy. I know you can. I know you do. But I'm petrified here. Even though this is supposed to be my fight. I don't want to have to worry about you as well. The look on Lydia's face made him flinch. She raised a hand, then thought better of it. I swear to God, lad. I love you, but I've got no time for this bullshit. Miles' breath caught in his throat. Had he heard that right? He swallowed. You... L really? Now? Lydia said, eyebrow raised. He lowered his head and muttered. Sorry. She kissed him on the forehead. A little too hard. There we go. Now, are we done with this conversation? He blinked. She was right. Now was no time to be getting distracted. No, hold on. I still don't want you to be part of this. I want you to be safe. And I want you to be there for Saz no matter what else happens. The mention of her daughter gave Lydia pause. Whatever she was thinking, she moved her mouth like she was sucking on a particularly sour sweet. Then glowered at him. Alright, fine. Miles let go aside. But if you fail, then none of us can escape what follows. So from then on, I'm fucking fighting. No arguments. None? Good. She grabbed his face and pulled him into a firm, almost painful kiss. Her lips pressed hard against his. He reached up to put his hands over hers, as if to break her grip. She bit down hard on his lower lip, making him cry out, then whispered, a fuck me, into his mouth. Afterwards, as they straightened themselves up and put their clothes back on, Lydia hardly took her eyes off him. There was a frown on her face and a wrinkle on her forehead. Miles stared back, torn between wanting to ask what was the matter and not being sure he actually wanted to know. Finally, she kissed him, far softer and more tenderly than she had earlier. I'm not going to fight, because you asked, she said. That means I can't watch over you. So don't you dare die while I'm not there, okay? He was on the tip of his tongue to make a joke about not planning to die. He choked it down and said, I promise, instead. Then he kissed away the tears rolling down her cheeks. Some hours later, Gaz was sat on a park bench. 
watching at a distance as a group of young girls who should have been in school sat on the grass and smoked. His mind was still on what had happened to Blair. He hadn't appeared on the news anywhere, so evidently had somehow managed to stay unseen after crawling away from them. A man in a dark suit, with black hair and a plain face, sat next to him. They're a bit young for you, at hazard, he said. Gaz looked at him and smiled. Whereas you're exactly old enough to have your throat torn out. Please, there's no need for that. I'm not your enemy. Who are you then? My name is Lucius, and you know that I'm no more human than you are. So? Lucius grinned. So we have a mutual interest. What might that be? The champion of man. Lucius put a hand on his shoulder. Something shifted around him. He felt dizzy, faint. His stomach somersaulted. The low shrubbery and flowers of the park around him faded and dissolved, revealing behind them a row of trees running parallel with a stone path. The sun was in his eyes and his vision turned green. He doubled over and heaved, though nothing came out. Take a moment. I imagine that was quite disorienting. What the fuck was that? Daz coughed when he spoke. Where are we? Somewhere more vital to our shared interest than watching schoolgirls in a park. Lucius gestured at the fence. It was one of a long row on the opposite sides of the trees, also running parallel to the path. Behind each one was the back garden of a house. That's where we are. You have to fetch a present for the champion. Gaz walked over to the fence Lucius suggested that, but he couldn't see anything. He put both hands on top of it and pulled himself up. He only peered over for a second, but he recognised the red-haired girl he could see through the back kitchen window. Okay, great, he said, dropping down again. But where are... He stopped in mid-sentence, because he was talking to himself. Lucius had vanished. The young man stumbled up the steps and was stopped from falling only by the hands that gripped under his arms. His name was John. He couldn't see a thing, and his face itched from the sack over his face. He carried on walking, his direction determined by the shoving in his back and sides, until an arm across his chest brought him to a stop. Someone kicked the back of his legs and he cried out, wincing as he hit the floor. Then the darkness became daylight, and he found himself staring up at a silhouette of a man with a sack in his hand. Beyond him was the Metropolitan Cathedral a vast conical building topped by a cylindrical fustrum which ended in a crown of spiked pinnacles. Its support gave it a tent-like appearance, which earned it its nickname Paddy's Wigwam. They were behind it, on a raised open square which served as roof to the crypt. There was a cry close to him. He turned to see another man, maybe the same age as him, being kicked to the ground and having the sack pulled off his face. Nor were they the only two. John counted another eight men around the square, those standing over them weren't all men, but they all had the same pallid complexion. He squinted to see their faces, and when he did, the sound that escaped his mouth was high and shrill. They were all twisted, with sunken cheeks, ridged foreheads, and eyes that glowed red. The man standing over him hit him, and pain flared across his face. Oh, shut up. You sound like a girl. No one can hear. No one fucking cares, anyway. He glanced behind him. Just beyond the steps, he could see the tops of two police vans and past them little to no human traffic across Brownlow Hill. Certainly, nobody was rushing up the steps in response to his scream. That's enough. The new voice had a strange accent. Its owner swept past him into the middle of the square, his trench coat flowing behind him, a bizarre clothing choice given how hot it was. The quarry is here for a purpose, and that purpose is not your amusement. What do you want with us? Another man shouted, Why are you doing this? The man in the coat didn't answer. Instead, he looked at another one of their captors. Night will fall soon. In the meantime, all you have to do is keep them here. To do what? What happened once night came? Nothing good in the company of these things. John's legs were trembling, and he found himself saying, Oh God, oh God, over and over. The man in the trench coat strolled over to him, grabbed his jaw and slapped him hard enough to make his ears ring. And keep them quiet. Chapter 19 Lydia groaned as she came to. An ache ran across her neck and down her back, 
which was contorted awkwardly against the hard back of the chair. She opened her eyes and the harsh fluorescent lights made her wince. When she turned her head, she saw the man in front of her. It took a couple of seconds for her to focus on him, but when she did, she recognised him. From the night Michelle had died, from the confrontation outside Jess's house, he wore the same monstrous face that he had in that second encounter, his grin showing off the horrible pointed teeth that filled his mouth. She gasped, Welcome back, love, Jazz said. It was touch and go for a bit whether you'd actually wake up in time. But here we are. The image of a fist smacking into her face flashed to her mind. But her face didn't feel sore. The only pain she had was that running down her spine, alongside an emptiness in the pit of her stomach. She shifted in the seat, her whole body tensed. Then she went cold. Sarah. She hadn't too long gotten in the house. But as ever, Cassie hadn't stayed too long once Lydia was back. The two had nothing in common beyond the love for the little girl, and they had both long since learned that it was easiest just to keep a distance to avoid any rows. But that meant it was only Lydia and her daughter in the house. Your daughter's fine, in case you're wondering, I said. Well, for now. She is home alone, which is a big parent and no-no, just so you know. But I didn't need that, if that's what you're worried about. I'm not an animal. Lydia closed her eyes and let out a shuddering sigh. He had to be telling the truth, because she couldn't take any other possibility right now. Her little girl was alive. What's the matter? You don't have to be afraid of me. We can be the best of friends. She sucked in a breath, summoned her courage and met his stare. Fuck you. If you're going to kill me, just get it over with already. Suddenly, his face was right in front of hers, and she yelped. Yeah. That would have been more convincing if you didn't stam her love. He brought his lips to her neck and kissed her, lightly. A shudder ran through her body and he laughed. Now I'm not about to kill you. If I did, this would have been a waste of effort. What then? She asked. His eyes followed hers and she swallowed. Ah. He poked her nose with his finger before standing up and stepping away from her. Now that would be telling. John had lost track of how long they'd been on the courtyard above the cathedral, yet still nobody had come for them. Occasionally he'd hear someone on Brownlow Hill stop and ask what was going on. The police would tell them that there was filming in progress and they couldn't go near it. He'd given up on screaming for their attention, his face swelling with the bruises he got for trying. His wrists itched from the rope tied around them. He was bound to a stake, one of them their captors had raised in a circle in the courtyard. The men were all facing out from one another, so he could only see the one immediately to his left and immediately to his right, at the edge of his peripheral vision. He was facing southwest and had to glint against the dark orange glare of the setting sun. There was a sound like a tent flapping in the wind and then a thud. His captors, or at least those that he could see, all turned to face something out of his field of vision. They dropped to one knee and bowed their heads. Sire! The man with the foreign accent said. Get up, a new voice replied, with no distinguishable accent at all. We have no need for formalities. They all stood up again. The foreign man in the trench coat stepped into John's line of sight, waving the others away. They moved out and lined up in a circle, facing out away from the square. He could now see the newcomer. He was tall and strong looking, with thick brown hair that shone with the hint of copper. A square jaw and a handsome face. All his clothes seemed brand new, too neat and too clean to have been worn very long. He reached into the inside pocket of his jacket and pulled something out. It was a knife, a crude one with a bronze blade. John's stomach tightened and a lump formed in his throat, making it hard to breathe. Shall we begin? He said. The sun is almost set and the time of sacrifice is upon us. The piazza below the Metropolitan Cathedral was empty when they reached it, but Miles pointed out the shapes gathered at the top of the wide, tall flight of steps that led up to the entrance. It looks like our vampire informant was telling us the truth, he said. Hazel nodded and got on her phone, a quick text confirming to everyone gathered that this was the place. Fortunately, foot traffic on this side of the cathedral was sparse, most of the people out in the night being clustered further down by the Philharmonic Hall or even further into the centre of town. They were unlikely to have much of an audience when it came down to a fight. 
Something moved in the corner of Miles' vision. He turned and saw Gaz and Lydia approaching them. The vampire had his hand at his hostage's throat, and he showed no fear of the group facing him. There were tears in Lydia's eyes, and her hands were trembling. Oh, hi, champion, Gaz said, grinning. Your girlfriend said I just had to meet you. Miles clenched his fist at his sides. Let her go. The vampire laughed. Yeah, all right then. He squeezed Lydia's throat, making her cry out. Miles glanced at Jack, and he could see the worry in the man's eyes. He took a step towards Gaz and growled. Guerta. Miles, stop, Hazel said. Miles saw Hazel was frowning. He followed her gaze to Lydia and saw that she was sobbing quietly, her nostrils flaring and lips trembling. But that wasn't all he saw. His chest tightened and he gritted his teeth. Gaz caught his gaze and grinned before he let go of Lydia's neck. She staggered forward but didn't quite fall. She looked up at Miles, then back at her captor. She was still crying. Miles ran forward and snatched her, but Gaz didn't even move. Hazel took a step towards them. Miles, she's... I know. Back off. What? Jack said. Jess put her hand on his shoulder. Miles, what's going on? Stay back. He pushed her hand away. Lydia struggled in his arms. Miles, please, you hurt me. She cried out and her face transformed, her skin turning to yellow and grey. He let go of her, but put an arm out so that he was between her and the rest of the group. If it's any consolation, she hasn't fed yet, Gaz said. Miles glowered at him before turning his attention back to Lydia. He gripped both of his shoulders. Lydia, listen. I know what he did to you, but it's okay. We're going to get through this. No, Miles. It was Hazel again. I said back off, he growled. Another hand grabbed his arm. He looked and saw Joel's eyes flicking between him and Lydia. Miles, she's right. No. He could feel his arms trembling violently. This was all too much to handle, and he couldn't think straight. Stop. Lydia yelled. What's going on? Miles, what's happening? Lydia... He lowered his arm and let out a deep breath to stop himself shaking. Then he threw a punch. It connected with her jaw and she collapsed to the floor. He looked at Hazel. Restrain her. No arguments or tricks. Just keep her contained until we have time to deal with this, okay? She was scowling, but she nodded. He turned around again, but Gaz had gone. He didn't know what language the words were in. But John was pretty sure that he didn't like the tone of them. The newest of his captors, the one with the knife, spoke them as he moved around the circle. He had run the blade across his own palm first, blood welling up along the line of the cut. Then he had cut across the chest of the man tied up to John's right. It had been a shallow cut from what he could see, but enough to make him gasp with pain. Then he moved on, continuing to chant, the gasps and cries of the other men reaching John's ears, as they were cut in the same way. He was last, and gritted his teeth so that he at least didn't cry out. It stung, and a tear ran down his cheek when he closed his eyes. The man's voice rose to a shout, and he said the last words of his chant. He smacked his hand into John's chest, and it knocked the wind out of him. The blood on the man's hand touched that on his chest, and he could feel it. An electric tingle, like pins and needles, and the world around him turned grey. Then a sharp, cold shock as the knife sliced across his throat. It cut through his windpipe and he gasped, except that no sound came out. He couldn't swallow. His chest moved up and down, trying to suck in air, but nothing was happening. He could feel the blood running down from the wound on his neck, but could do nothing about it except choke and gasp. Out of the corner of his eye, he could see the man move back to the man whose chest he had cut previously and slit his throat too. John closed his eyes and willed the world away. His throat felt like it was collapsing, crushing his windpipe. All he could do was lie there and wait for the world to fade away. Anil approached the police officer standing next to the van. He glanced at her, but otherwise didn't react to her presence. Excuse me, officer, but what's going on? He waved a hand. They're filming. I think it's a low-budget production, but nobody's allowed to go up there. There's not much up here for tourists at night anyway. 
She opened her coat and pulled the blade from the sheath running down his side, swinging it at the officer's neck in the same move. I'm not a tourist. The head came off in a clean, single blow and rolled along the floor. The door to the van opened and two more police officers emerged, both with their vampire faces exposed. Anaya lifted his sword and swung again, but the first officer left his sword and kicked her in the side. She fell to one knee. The other jumped at her and she dived out the way, slicing his sword up his back so that he fell over. She jumped up, dodging the first one's fist. Wood's sword ran through him as Anaya lifted her own blade and brought it down on his friend. The officer rolled so that instead of taking his head, Anaya took his arm. He screamed, alerting everyone up on the elevated square beyond where they were fighting. The first few of them came running down the steps. Wood decapitated the officer skewered on his first sword with his second. Here we go, he said. Let's hope everyone else is in position. Anaya moved to his side, blood dripping off her own blade. It's been a while, hasn't it? He said. Since we faced a vampire horde, or just since we had a good fight? He grinned. Both. She sidestepped away from him and drew her blade up in an arc. The nearest vampire leapt backwards, off balance. Anayal caught her with a kick, making her double over, then slammed her sword down on the neck for a clean kill. Already a second, this one man was on it. He ducked his punch and jabbed her fingertips at his throat making him gag and raise his hands to the neck in pain. A kick to the right side of the head caught her off guard. She staggered, then ducked a punch from the left. The hilt of her sword found his gut, and when she stood up again, the blade found his neck. She kicked the head as it fell, right into the face of another male. He battered it away with ease, but it distracted him long enough for her aisle to get in his face and drive a sword through it. Up ahead of her, Puth ducked to avoid a sledgehammer, then raised his swords to block a crowbar. He pushed himself to his feet, knocking the female with the crowbar backwards. He swung one sword to his left and scalped a male who fell to his knees, screaming. Anaya kicked the male who was still gagging on the floor and jumped over the bodies nearby. The hammer was up in the air again, so she cut through its own spinal column at the base of his neck with her blade. A handful of fighters from the guild had joined them now, and there were a couple of small piles of bodies littering the ground but they were still vastly outnumbered. How many are there? Twith yelled across what was now a battlefield. Out on a limb, Anaya said, grunting when she kicked a female vampire in the head. I'm going to say lots. Over on the other side of the cathedral, Miles dashed up the steps. Ahead of him, Jess, Kit and Joel had just waded into a group of about ten vampires. Further to his right, Hazel and Jack were skirmishing with another four opponents. Still more, he estimated 50 in total, were moving in on them. He leapt from the second to the top step, the jump taking him over Jess as she brought her blade up under the chin of a vampire that had Kit pinned to the ground. As he landed, he threw a fist into the face of a short, overweight vampire in front of him. He ran around the cathedral towards the square at the back, shoulder barging another two who had moved to try and intercept him, and shoving a third with both hands. A circle of stakes stood in the centre of the square. Tied to each one was a man, battered and bloodied with their throat cut. Slumped on the floor by each stake was another man, naked, shivering and for the most part unconscious. A sharp ethereal blue light surrounded each of them. One of them at the far side of the circle wasn't slumped, but was being held up by a hand to the throat. The vampire holding him had its mouth to his shoulder, teeth piercing the neck. Miles could not just hear and smell, but could feel the blood flowing out of the open vein and into the creature's mouth. A pair of arms grabbed Miles from behind, restraining him. The female appeared in front of him, grinning through her razor-sharp teeth and holding an axe. She raised it up to swing. Miles threw his head back, butting his captor. The axe swung. Miles ducked, gripping the hands at his chest and pulling forward. There was a cry and then a thud. The hands went limp and Miles let the body fall behind him as he leapt up, throwing an uppercut into the female's chin. He bent to grab the axe that clattered on the floor beside him. The naked man was no longer being fed upon, but had his own lips forcibly pressed to the creature's wrist. There was a wound there, Miles knew, and as limp as the rest of his body was, he drank from it enthusiastically. Miles saw the kick flying out from the corner of his eye. He rolled out of its reach and swung the axe. It hit nothing but air. And snatched the weapon from Miles. Miles dodged a punch and threw his own. 
The attacker blocked and threw a jab. It caught Miles' cheek and he staggered backwards a step. You cannot hope to win this fight, champion, the male said in a deep Eastern European accent. You are fighting against prophecy. Mars blocked the next punch and jumped backwards to avoid a kick. He managed to land the fist to the chest, but it barely knocked his opponents off balance. He ducked a swing and moved to the left, this time catching him in the cheek. This had more effect. There was a crowd and the sound of steel clashing by the stairs down to Brownlow Hill. Miles couldn't see them, but he knew that was where an island booth would be fighting their way up. He grabbed the tail of his opponent's trench coat and heaved, spinning towards the stairs. The vampire skidded across the ground, crashing and rolling into the back of the crowd by the stairs. Miles didn't stop to watch the resulting pileup. The vampire by the stakes had lifted another of the men off the floor and was drinking. Miles broke into a sprint and threw himself at the vampire's back. The naked man cried out as they all fell to the floor. Miles slammed his elbow into the creature's head as they tumbled. He threw more punches as they rolled, ending up face to face. The vampire still had a human face, and his resemblance to Puth, and to Miles for that matter, was immediately obvious even amid the scuffle. A fist hit his side and Miles cried out. The pain ripped through his torso like a bolt of fire. Another connected with his jaw. He felt bones slide out of joint. Blood erupted from his mouth and his ears rang. A third punch smashed into his cheek, sending him rolling across the ground. His face felt numb and his head swelled. Pushing up to a sitting position, he saw that Anil and Puth had reached the square but were still surrounded. He also realised that everything had gone grey. The creature dusted himself down and walked back to his last victim, lifting him up and forcing the man's mouth to the wound on his arm. He appeared oblivious of Miles and of the battles now raging on the opposite side of the square. That man had evidently drunk enough, since he let him fall to the ground and moved on to the next. Miles closed his eyes and willed his head to stop spinning. He could still hear the battles around him, the clash of steel, wood and flesh. Everyone on his side was still alive, he knew, but their foes weren't falling easily. There must have been close to 200 gathered before everything started, and he reckoned there were still over 150 in the fight. They had brought too few people. But that wasn't all he could hear. The blood of the man currently being drained might as well have been pumping through his head. He could feel the heartbeats and shallow breathing of the men who were alive up on the floor. Only two of them from ten, which meant there wasn't long left. He pushed himself to his feet. His legs were still trembling, his torso burned with pain, and his head still felt as though it weren't entirely solid. He grasped his chin and pulled it to click his jaw back in place, wincing at the bolt of pain that shot up from the sides of his face. So, you're no other iron dawn, he shouted. He got no reaction. The second's last victim was now being drained. Miles could almost taste the blood on his tongue. It was rich and sweet. He closed his eyes again, and the world seemed to tilt to one side. He staggered and had to put his hands out to steady himself. There was a cry of pain. He recognised his sister's voice and looked towards the front of the cathedral, but he could see nothing. They had been driven back out of sight. He couldn't go to her and help, because if he moved his feet, his legs would give out on him. He turned towards the other battle and could see that they were faring no better. Miles clenched his fist and shouted, no words, just a roar. He charged. Noadu finally looked up in his direction, pulling his arm away from the man and drinking from it, who had collapsed to the floor. He lashed out as Miles reached him. Miles ducked backwards, avoiding the punch and getting behind Noadu. Miles grabbed his opponent's shirt and pulled, toppling him to the floor and tearing the fabric off his back. He managed to get in two sharp kicks to the side whilst he was down. Noadu caught the third and shoved him so hard that he collapsed on his back, the wind knocked out of him. Noadu hopped to his feet easily and ripped the last shred of fabric off his chest before he transformed. Like the others, his face transformed. Sunken cheeks, knotted brow, bangs and claw-like nails. Unlike them, his skin turned a leathery brown so deep it was almost black. Bones tore the skin as they grew out of his shoulders and down out of his lower back thin and pointed, until they formed the frames of an enormous pair of wings. The skin regenerated rapidly, growing over the bones, 
and stretching thin across the space between them. Mars scrambled backwards until there was a few feet of space between them, then pushed himself upright. His back and sides protested, and he resisted the urge to double over. There was a shout behind Nuadu in a language Mars didn't recognise. They both looked to see the last of the naked men, a blue glow still surrounding his body, walking towards them. His feet were unsteady, but his eyes were on Nuadu. He pointed and shouted again, still coming forward. No! Miles shouted. No, get back! Don't! Nuadu's fist struck him in the chest. He felt the skin rupture. He went to cry out, but vomited blood instead. The whale turned a peculiar shade of green and faded out. He couldn't feel his legs, and then he tumbled. He had no idea what he had crashed into, except that a moment later he was at the bottom of the steps on Brownlow Hill and being dragged up the road by a Nile. Ears were streaming down her face and... Was she glowing? There was a squeal of tyres as Jack's fan appeared in front of him. There were shouts and cries, but he had no idea who was saying what. A hand shoved him into the back and closed the door behind him. Then everything went black. Chapter 20 it was over an hour after the battle, and Hazel hadn't stopped pacing since they got back. Nobody else would sit down. Joel could feel the attention pouring into him, and he knew that he didn't want to be in the room. But he also knew that he couldn't leave either. We shouldn't have gone off half cock like that, Jack said. Christ, we were lucky nobody got killed. How could we have known? Where the hell did he pull 200 vampires from? Somebody else said. It's been centuries since they've had that kind of numbers. Hazel shook her head. They've clearly been preparing for this a lot longer than we have. They also knew exactly how to catch us off guard, clearly. And we let them. There were bags under Jack's eyes and all the colour was gone from his face. We did pretty much exactly what they wanted us to do, and now we've paid the price for it. Joe looked from Jack to Jess and Kit and saw that they all wore the same expression. It wasn't just the frustration etched onto everyone else's faces. I don't think anything we could have done would have made much difference, Joel said. It's right that we tried, but we're dealing with matters which have long shadows in prophecy. These events aren't what might or could be, but what shall be. At least we didn't lose anybody. Didn't we? That's not what I'm going to have to tell my wife and daughter in the morning. Or my niece when I have to tell her the real reason she was left home alone all night and I'll never see her mummy again. The silence that followed Jack's words was heavy. Joel could hear only his own breathing. Everybody had their shoulders hunched and their arms crossed or their hands on their hips. Nobody met anybody else's eyes, except Hazel. She was glowering at Joel, probably guessing what he was about to say. We don't know for sure. It's not going to work, she snapped. Jack said nothing, only stared at the ground. Vampires subsist on blood. Human blood, she went on. They don't just want it, they need it. Crave it. We can either do what needs to be done now, or after she's fed and her immortal soul has been condemned forever. But Miles... Miles is a champion of man. The girl isn't, Hazel said. Jess looked Hazel in the eye. Come on, leave it. I know Miles, she said. He's strong. He'll do whatever needs to be done. Just give him some time, okay? Hazel frowned, not looking convinced, but she nodded. Miles cast his eyes over the various blades in the cabinet against the wall before he turned to face Lydia again. How are you feeling now? They were in a room which appeared at odds with the entire rest of Cyclade's house, with no natural light and brightly lit by harsh fluorescence. It had a smooth and largely empty laminated floor, and for the most part looked like a backup gym room but there were also cabinets and office furniture dotted around the walls as well. Better, I think. She put the glass of blood down on the cabinet next to her. She was sitting on a small chest of drawers, idly swinging her legs. But it's weird, the thought of having to drink that stuff as my food. Know what I mean? Yeah, I think I do. How long was Sazie on her own? I mean, after... She's fine. She's in Abby and Jack's and I think already forgetting why she was so upset earlier. She keeps asking after you, of course. He smiled, 
tears welling in his eyes. I'm sorry. What? Why are you sorry? It's my fault. He crossed the room, slowly as his legs were still shaky from the fight earlier. He put his arms out and she stood up to move into their embrace. If I hadn't insisted that you not come along to stay safe, he let out a sharp bark of laughter. If I hadn't done that, this wouldn't have happened. There's no way you could have known that, she said. You were worried? It's only natural. He squeezed her tighter, blinking away tears. Still, all of this is down to me. Everything that's happened and everyone who's died, not just you. It's all because the vampires are after me. They stood like that for several moments, everything around them still and silent. Lydia pulled out of his arms and looked up at him, her face streaked with tears. Miles? Yeah? How weird is it being alive to lament your own untimely death? They both burst out laughing. But tears streamed down Miles' cheeks, and soon enough his laughter turned to choke sobs. Miles, are you okay? He sniffed and swallowed, rubbing his eyes and his nose with his hands. He shook his head and looked away. He had to be stronger than this. For her. I'm fine. Okay. He picked up a glass. Can I have some more blood? Already? Miles thought, in dismay. His chest tensed up. This sent a hot flare of pain through his ribcage, making him wince. He walked up behind her and put his hand over hers. Lydia, that's a weak supply. She met his eyes. Hairs were glowing red, though the rest of her face was still human. Really? It seems too little. I'm still thirsty. You can't have any more. Why not? Her face transformed, but she didn't seem to notice. I'm thirsty? Thirsty? You know what I mean? There's a deep aching pit in my stomach and I need to fill it. The blood was good. It had the right taste and smell to it, but the pit's still there and I want more. He closed his eyes and more tears streamed down his face. I'm sorry, I am controlling it like you said. But I'm not as strong as you, so I need more to do it. He forced a smile, even though tears kept streaming and he could feel a lump in his throat. It's okay, I'll pour you another one. He retrieved a plastic jug full of car's blood from the other side of the room and poured more into the glass she had been drinking from. He handed it to her. Here. Take it slow this time though, okay? She nodded, but straight away tipped the glass up to chug. He stepped over to the workbench nearby, picking up his machete. He gripped it tight at his side to stop his hands shaking, and wandered back to her. She looked down at the blade, then back at him when she had finished drinking. He didn't acknowledge that she'd noticed the machete. Instead, he pulled her towards him with his free hand and kissed her. Pain shot through his jaw, but he closed his eyes and kissed her harder. His pain didn't matter now, only hers. More tears flowed at the thought of what he had to do when the kiss was over. He returned the embrace and the kiss, stroking his neck with one hand. Miles, he said when the kiss ended. I really am sorry for what happened. Don't be. It wasn't your fault. I'm the one who behaved like a massive twat. She laughed at that, and her human face re-emerged. She put her hand to his cheek, gently, then stood up on her tiptoes to kiss the cuts on his face. It stung for a moment, then tingled. Her teeth brushed his cheek, and he realised Lydia was lapping at the blood of his wounds. He pushed her away. Her face had transformed again, and she growled when their eyes met. Lydia, stop! She grabbed at his trousers. Doesn't feel like you minded it. Why don't you just let this happen so that we can both be happy? Because this isn't you. He shoved her away again, but still didn't raise the machete. His grip on it was tight enough now that he could feel the grooves of the hilt digging into his palms. Please don't do this, Lid. Fight it. Please. She laughed. It was almost a cackle, until her face reverted to human once more, and the laughs became sobs. Miles saw her legs tremble, and moved forward to catch her before she fell. She steadied herself, and stared him in the eye. Her eyes, still glowing red, glistened with tears. I can't do this, Mai. I'm not strong enough. You are? He lied, 
taking your hand. I promise you, you are strong enough. As hellish as this all feels right now, gets easier. You just need to hold on. He kissed her, conscious of her body shaking as it pressed against his. He pulled back from the kiss and looked at her again. Her face was still human, and her lips were trembling. He held her gaze. I love you, Lydia. Why hadn't he said that before? Even once. Why only now? I love you too. It had to be now. He had no other choice, he knew. He had time stood still, and a thousand arguments against it rushed through his mind. It wasn't fair. He loved her. Even if it was harder for her than him, she had to be given a real chance. He accepted and agreed with every excuse that his mind offered up. He couldn't do this. Except, he did. She didn't see him raise the machete. The blade sliced clean through her neck in a single blow. Her head hit the floor with a wet thump and rolled. Blood erupted from her neck in a high arc for three long seconds before the pressure fell and it welled and dribbled out. Her body crumpled to the floor. The silence that followed made the room seem smaller, more oppressive. For the longest time, Miles could only stare at the blood, the meat, the headless body that had been the woman he loved. Then the sobs took him to his knees and he buried his head in his hands. When Miles eventually came back, Everybody fell silent. His shirt and face were splattered with blood. He didn't look at any of them, except Jack, who he walked over to. The two stared at each other in silence for several moments, until Jack closed his eyes and nodded. Miles turned and walked back out of the room, still without looking at anyone. An aisle moved as if to follow him. Jess put an arm out in front of her. Wait, I'll go. But... Trust me. Jess patted her on the shoulder before following Miles outside into the street. It was empty. There was a chill on the wind and her eyes took a few seconds to adjust from the light in the house to the darkness of the night. Her brother was leaning against the wall. Smoking. Hey. You alright? He looked at her and took another drag of his cigarette but said nothing. His eyes were bloodshot and she could still see the tracks of the tears that had been running down his face. Can I nick a fag? Miles stuck another cigarette in his mouth, lit it with the end of his, and passed it to her. She took a spot on the wall next to him, and they smoked in silence. A cat hissed and darted across the road into a bush. A few minutes later, Miles stubbed out the end of his cigarette under his foot. Jess finished her own cigarette not long after and flicked the dog end out into the road. I killed her, Jess, he said, his voice shaky. He turned away when she tried to look at him. She was... It was still Lydia. She was scared and confused. Tears ran down his cheeks. And I killed her. Miles, he said, feeling a lump in her throat. She wasn't like you. She didn't have the strength to resist the craving for human blood forever and keep her soul. You know that. He met her eyes. He said she was thirsty, but it wasn't thirst. I could feel. The dog started barking all the way down the street. Yes, couldn't tell how many, but it was a frantic, distressed sound that made her wince. Yelps and howling mixed in with the barks. Lights flicked on in several houses, followed by shouts of "Shut up!" and similar. Miles' eyes had widened. Can you hear something? He nodded. The ground started shaking, the rumbling silencing the animals and the humans. It threw Jess off balance and Miles caught her. The shaking lessened. As it did, a sound rose to take its place. It started as a low, rumbling hum, but grew louder rapidly. The door opened and everyone piled outside. The pubs on either side of the building emptied, the streets filling with people who were all very quickly sobering up. In the gap between the shops across the road, Miles could also see residents coming out of houses in the streets behind, most in pyjamas and all looking confused and scared. Most of the people on the streets had their phones out, filming. What's going on? Jess couldn't tell who shouted over the din. Someone else yelled a reply, but she couldn't hear it. Everyone clutched their hands to their ears, all crying and shouting. All sound drowned out by that one writhing note as the trumpet reached the crescendo.
Thank you very much for listening. If you enjoyed this and want more, then you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, Philip Dickens Books, or search for From the Hill of Megado on your favourite podcast service. Next week, we'll be finding out what happens in the aftermath of the trumpet sounding. See you then.